Hello and welcome back to MLab 1101, Introduction to Clinical Laboratory Science. My name is Dustin Scott Brewster, and this is going to be the second of our six-part presentation series on clinical laboratory testing. In this presentation, we're going to cover the hematology department. To find the objectives for this presentation, log on to Blackboard. On the left-hand side, select the Schedule tab. Scroll down to unit number five, and in that row, you'll find the link for the objectives for this course. So what is hematology and why is it important? Hematology is the study of the cellular components of your blood. Every time you fall down and scrape your knee, that red stuff that comes out is blood. And about half of that is made up of cells. Those cells include white blood cells known as leukocytes. They're used for fighting bacterial, viral, fungal, and parasitic infection. Red blood cells, which gives it that red color and why it's called red blood cells, also known as erythrocytes, their primary role is to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide throughout our circulatory system. In addition to that, and important for when we do fall down and scrape our knee, are platelets, known as thrombocytes. Their role is to form a clot and keep you from bleeding too much. So why do we need to know about these cellular components and why would we quantify them in a clinical chemistry or clinical hematology lab? Well, the purpose for knowing about these cellular components helps us to screen, diagnose, and monitor hematologic disease. Some of those diseases include anemias, which can often be detected from a decrease in one or more of the red blood cell indices. Infections can be indicated when we have an elevation in white blood cells. Leukemias too can be detected often from an elevation of white blood cells. And then we can monitor our platelets. And one thing that could go wrong is thrombocytopenia, which is a decrease in platelet count and is often seen from excessive bleeding. Additionally, we could have thrombocytosis, which is an elevation of platelets and also not something that is good. So before we start hematology testing, we need to collect the sample. To do that, we need an anticoagulant tube and most often is an EDTA tube. EDTA acts as an anticoagulant and prevents our blood from clotting. We test whole blood samples in hematology. So blood that has been collected, mixed with an anticoagulant, and unspun. So it is whole blood. That whole blood anticoagulant sample is then taken to the hematology department where it's often tested on an automated instrument. A few examples of automated instruments include the Coulter counter by Beckman, Celdine, which is made by Abbott, and the Exin analyzer, which is manufactured by Sysmex. Each of these instruments use the same methodology, which works by pulling the cells through an aperture, which contains an electrical current. As the cells pass that electrical current, the electrical signal is interrupted. This is known as an electrical impedance. Based on the interruption of that electrical current, will determine the size of the cell and the frequency of interruptions determines the number of cells that are passing through that aperture and that's how the automated analyzer works to count those cells. So some common tests that are performed in the hematology department are simply a white blood cell count which will give you the total number of white blood cells and H and H will give you a result for your hemoglobin and hematocrit, both indices of the red blood cell component of your blood. And we can do a simple platelet count, which will just simply give us the total number of platelets in a patient's peripheral blood. If a physician wants a more comprehensive view of the cellular components of your blood, they can order what's called a complete blood count. A complete blood count gives you the total number of white blood cells and what's often associated with that is a differential. It can be either a manual differential or an automated differential where those white blood cells counted will be differentiated into each type of white blood cell, which we'll discuss in the next slide. 
the red blood cell components are broken into the following indices. The total number of red blood cells, the hemoglobin, hematocrit, mean corpuscle volume, mean corpuscle hemoglobin, mean corpuscle hemoglobin concentration are all indices of the red blood cell component of your blood. Platelets are counted as the total number of platelets and the mean platelet volume, which gives you the approximate size average of the platelets counted. So white blood cell differentials, which are often a part of a complete blood count. So why would we wanna differentiate the white blood cells? Well, each white blood cell serves a different purpose. So depending on which population may be elevated, we can get an idea of what kind of infection may be present in the patient. For example, neutrophils, a type of granulocyte, if elevated, can give the idea that there's a bacterial infection present. If the lymphocytic cell line is elevated, we can get the idea that it's possibly a viral infection. Lymphocytes are used for fighting viruses. Monocytes are often elevated in the presence of a respiratory viral infection. Eosinophils, another type of granulocyte, are elevated with allergic reactions and sometimes with parasitic infections. This elevation of eosinophils is known as Loeffler syndrome. Basophils, another type of granulocyte, are elevated and as an inflammation of nonspecific origin. Additional tests that can be performed in the hematology lab include the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or ESR. This is a nonspecific indicator of inflammation. A reticulocyte count. The reticulocytes are immature red blood cells, and an increase in reticulocytes can indicate a hemolytic anemia. Another type of test that's often performed in the hematology department includes sickle cell testing. Sickle cell trait or sickle cell disease is the result of a genetic mutation. This produces sickling in red blood cells and causes a decreased ability to carry oxygen. So often married to the hematology department is the coagulation department. Coagulation is the body's ability to form a clot, and it's typically measured by one of two tests. The prothrombin time tests measures the extrinsic clotting pathway and the common clotting pathway. And the other test is the activated partial thromboplastin time test, which is simply just said PTT. The PTT test measures the intrinsic clotting pathway as well as the common clotting pathway. So the PT and the PTT are the two common tests performed in the coagulation department. So to illustrate that concept a little better, we have three different pathways. We have factors of the intrinsic pathway, we have factors of the extrinsic pathway, and factors of the common pathway. And testing the PT and PTT will give us an indication of a pathway-specific clotting factor deficiency, a general clotting factor deficiency, or uh, possibly the presence of an anticoagulant like Coumadin. So coagulation is going to use a different tube. In the coagulation department, we are going to run that off a buffered sodium citrate tube. This is also an anticoagulant, but it needs to be filled to the correct volume with a 1 to 9 ratio of buffered sodium citrate to patient blood. The, the sample is then spun down and the liquid portion is separated from the cellular portion. Because this sample has been introduced to an anticoagulant, the sample has been prevented from clotting and therefore the clotting factors are still present. Because that's what we're testing for in the coagulation department, we want to have those clotting factors present in the upper portion of the liquid sample. And that is going to give us plasma. So just like the hematology department, the coagulation department is often going to use an automated instrument for testing the prothrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time. 
For testing the prothrombin time, the sample is introduced to thromboplastin and calcium and the amount of time it takes to form a clot from the time the sample is introduced to the time the sample clots is the prothrombin time. The activated partial thromboplastin time is measured by introducing ellagic acid and calcium into the sample and measuring the amount of time from the addition of these two reagents, ellagic acid and calcium, and the time it takes to form a clot. This is usually around 25 seconds. Additional tests that can be performed in the coagulation department include the thrombin time, which measures the activity of fibrinogen. Fibrinogen can be measured, which is an essential protein in clot formation. Fibrinogen to fibrin is the final step in the clotting cascade. Backing up to our diagram, we have fibrinogen being converted to fibrin, which acts to form a stable clot. And that is the final step in the coagulation cascade. Also important to measure. So in addition to prothrombin time, activated partial thromboplastin time, fibrinogen, and thrombin time, we can measure individual factors in more advanced labs, which will give us an idea of an individual deficiency in one of the factors for the coagulation cascade. These are known as factor studies or factor analysis. D-dimer is another test that's often performed in the coagulation department, which helps diagnose conditions related to thrombosis, which is the ability to form a clot. So uh, that'll be the end of our second presentation in our six-part presentation series, and we'll pick it back up with part three.